This is lecture one, the history and theory of patents. We basically have two things we're going to get done in this lecture, and one is to talk about the origins, some of the history of, of the patent law, um, particularly focusing on, on U.S. history, and then move to an introduction to theories of, of patent law. Uh, later in the course, we're going to talk a little more detail about uh, economic theories, in particular patent law, but this is a general overview of the various theories that, that underlie and animate the patent system. So let's dive in. The origins of the patent law. You can actually see the patent idea uh, existing from essentially the Grecian era onward. Uh, this basic concept of uh, some sort of incentive-based grant of a right by the government um, to individuals who do something that the government uh, likes uh, is uh, present in a lot of Greek thought. Um, however, it was largely rejected during the, this era as a matter of public policy. Um, it's for a number of reasons. The most important one seems to have been the idea that, that in this era of uh, human endeavor, the uh, highest form of intellectual achievement um, was more aesthetic than utilitarian. Uh, that is, uh, there was much higher value placed on uh, works of art uh, and uh, things of that nature, sculptures, uh, than on uh, useful, new and useful products. And therefore, to the extent you see things like prizes um, and other sorts of incentive-based mechanisms, um, they really are pretty much directed towards um, artistic and other uh, activities. So uh, although you can see the patent idea in, in classical history, uh, it's really not there as a matter of general policy. But where it does occur is the matter of general policy uh, is in the Italian Renaissance. Uh, in the Italian Renaissance, we definitely see the development uh, of a patent um, for innovation. And in particular, uh, the Venetian patent statute of 1474 really contains most of the major elements of the modern patent system. Uh, it contains a novelty requirement. Uh, it contains a requirement uh, that a patent be uh, reduced to practice or operative. Uh, it contains a uh, requirement uh, to uh, the patent or the, the invention that's going to get a patent being useful. Uh, it has a temporal limitation, 10 years, uh, for example. Uh, of how long this patent right uh, is in force. Um, it suggests, it implies that there's some sort of examination system because it has these requirements for uh, patents uh, that are present. So um, that's a uh, interesting aspect. And in fact, it's, it contains so many of the major elements of what we now understand to be modern patent systems uh, that in many ways uh, people uh, argue that, that really all we've been doing for the last 500 and some odd years is just adding detail and footnotes uh, to the Venetian patent statute of 1474 uh, because so much of what we now think of as the basic idea of a patent system uh, really can be found back uh, then in that, that statute. Um, that statute was, quite, was regarded as being quite successful at fostering technological development and innovation uh, in Venice uh, and therefore spread relatively rapidly as of course a lot of things did during the Renaissance where transportation and communication uh, became much more advanced. Uh, things like legal innovation uh, flourished as well and we now see uh, we saw patent statutes essentially spreading across the various city-states uh, and elsewhere where there was um, substantial economic development. The U.S. really, uh, as you might expect, has its orig its patent law origins, um, uh, gets it from England. Uh, and the, the English have a, um, uh, what, what might be described as a, a royal basis for uh, a patent system. Uh, so traditionally, in the royal uh, regime in England, uh, the king or his designees could grant royal monopolies, which were described as letters patent. Um, and these royal monopolies would be, as you would expect, a monopoly. They would give a grant to somebody uh, that would give them the exclusive right to do something, sell something, make something, whatever it was. Um, this is uh, 
would be granted not uh, because necessarily uh, there was any um, merit uh, on these. It might be that they, it might be merit, but it was often based on uh, who, uh, it was a patronage deal, basically, who you knew, uh, how it worked, uh, uh, or how, how you worked the system rather than any particular kind of innovation. As the royal system in uh, England developed and, and increasing amounts of limitations were placed upon the king's powers, uh, the Statue of Monopolies of 1624 was established. Um, and most interestingly, what the Statute of Monopolies did is essentially did away with all monopolies, except for in very limited circumstances. Uh, and those circumstances are what we now recognize as intellectual property rights, and in particular, patents. That is, although the statute of monopolies specifically outlaws the granting of royal monopolies and royal patents, it says that letters patent are still uh, authorized and available under certain circumstances, including things like novelty, utility, technological innovation, uh, and so forth. And that then leads to a period of a uh, few hundred years of English common law development where many of the modern features of, of what we now understand as a patent system get developed, um, including and most importantly uh, from the English perspective, uh, the development of, of what we know now as the specification uh, in the Liardet uh, case in, in 1778. Um, and it was specifically noted that this specification, that is a written description, a detailed written description of your invention, uh, that this specification was understood to be a consideration for the patent grant. That is, if you didn't have and didn't provide enough detailed information about your invention, uh, you could not get a patent. Uh, and that, again, is, is a core foundation of uh, patent law um, that we now know of um, and actually had not really been in play in much of the earlier patent systems. So that was an innovation that, that came out of the, the, the royal origins uh, of the system. In the U.S., um, of course, as you, I'm sure, know, um, the idea of having a patent system and, indeed, intellectual property rights generally is enshrined in uh, the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, uh, which says you can promote, uh, in order to promote progress uh, of the sciences and the arts, uh, you can grant uh, the, the um, in order to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Gives Congress the express power uh, to create things like the patent system. And Congress did. Uh, the Patent Acts of 1790 uh, and, and 1793, that's a bit of a typo on the slide there, uh, are examples of um, the uh, original federal laws, uh, indeed they were some of the very first federal laws ever created by the new uh, national government, um, related to the patents. The Patent Act of 1790 in particular uh, was an interesting one because it actually established, although it didn't establish an actual patent agency, it established a system whereby patents would be reviewed for their validity um, and the uh, a review of validity um, would be uh, undertaken uh, by a commission uh, which described themselves as commissioners for the promotion of the useful arts comprised of the Secretary of State, then Thomas Jefferson, the Secretary of War, then Henry Knox, and the Attorney General of the United States, then, Ed then Edmund Randolph. Uh, so you had quite a distinguished original set of patent examiners uh, in the Patent Act of 1790. The 1793 Act um, uh, was a response uh, to the fact that it, as you might imagine, became pretty burdensome for these people who had other otherwise important duties to be patent examining as well. And it, the, seven, the 1793 Act did away with most of the um, uh, oversight uh, and was in fact somewhat notorious for allowing way too many patents on things that uh, probably didn't deserve it. Uh, but it lasted about 40 years uh, until the Patent Act of 1838. And Patent Act of 1838 is, is really enters uh, patents into the administrative state. And in some ways, this is uh, the U.S. innovation worldwide in terms of the patent law, which is to create an administrative structure uh, whose duty is to actually review uh, and grant patents according to certain criteria. And that's exactly what the 1836 Act did um, and uh, established 
the patent office, established what we now understand to be patent examination, established what we now understand to be patent claims and the patent specification, documentation requirements, all of these things. And in fact, many of the cases that we're going to read um, uh, during the, the course of this semester uh, actually come out of this era uh, between 1836 and 1952 uh, when the Supreme Court was taking a whole bunch of patent cases uh, because it was one of the relatively few areas of federal law that generated a lot of, uh, a lot of case law. So modern U.S. developments, just to touch on these briefly, um, from basically from Reconstruction on, as I noted uh, a minute ago, you see a lot more activity in the courts. Uh, part of that is because there was a real explosion in patenting behavior during the Industrial Revolution, um, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about more um, when we talk about patent economics. Um, and in fact, some studies have shown that, that the, the quantity of, of patenting, uh, depending on how you measured it, uh, and the amount of litigation uh, during the period uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s is actually pretty commensurate with what is going on now uh, and in some ways might not be so, uh, it means that what's going on now might not be so surprising but more the reflection of, of rapid technological advancement. This greater court involvement um, ended up by the mid uh, 20th century uh, ended up uh, creating a situation where the U.S. Supreme Court in particular became very skeptical of patents. And this was part of, uh, of course, a larger um, thought process in the United States at that time, which is an anti-monopoly uh, era, right? So, so in the Industrial Revolution in the U.S., uh, a lot of monopolies, very large industrial organizations started up. You had the rise of the union movement sort of against that. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, sort of reaction against monopolies. And the Supreme Court, when it would review patent cases, often took the stance that, that monopolies were, you know, very strongly presumed to be uh, illegitimate. Uh, and very often they would strike down patents uh, for uh, reasons that struck uh, many observers at the time uh, as not being particularly well grounded uh, in anything more than just sort of an anti-monopoly idea. So what happened was the patent bar um, and uh, took it upon themselves to lobby Congress and draft a new patent act. And the, the new patent act largely tracked most of what was going on in the courts at that time, but change certain things in particular, as we'll find out, the standards for invention uh, to make it much more clear about which patents would and would not um, uh, qualify for uh, invention or, or for a patent or which innovations would or would not qualify for a patent. Uh, and really, the 1952 Act is what we're going to be studying this term. Uh, there's been uh, some changes uh, to it, obviously, here and there, some amendments. Last year, we had the American Events Act, which is certainly the largest set of reforms of the 1952 Patent Act, but really doesn't do a lot to alter the basic structure of the 1952 Patent Act, which is what, what we uh, deal with when we talk about our modern patent system. The next big development in the U.S. with respect to patents was the, was the creation of the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And this is a federal appeals court uh, that, whole, that, that will hear all patent cases. Uh, patent cases are federal, and they are a federal question uh, jurisdiction, which means you can file them uh, in any United States districts, district court. Uh, of course, those district court would, uh, would have to have a good venue and, and so forth. But um, given that, you can file it in any federal court. Uh, and then the appeal, instead of going to the regional appeal, uh, or a regional court of appeal, uh, as they would typically in the federal system, they go to the federal circuit. Um, and so it's an interesting uh, setup where um, you have a specialized court, but that specialized court is not the original court. It's a court of appeal and here's all appeals from all over the country relating to patent law. Uh, and the standard is anything that is related to patents 
goes to the federal circuit uh, and they decide. And the federal circuit's been in place since 1982. Um, and, uh, and so you know, for 30 years, we've had this sole appellate body um, and that has had a number of implications, both good and bad. It's been controversial, lots of talk about it. We'll discuss it throughout the term, um, and, uh, uh, but that is a major development. The other major development in the last, say, 15 years or so has been increasing international harmonization. And in part, this follows uh, the general trend worldwide of globalization, uh, where more countries are uh, more interconnected, um, more innovations are obviously uh, sold and developed worldwide. There are more companies doing work in multiple uh, countries. Uh, and so there's been increasing calls for the major patent systems of the world um, to harmonize themselves uh, into um, uh, some coherent whole and that isn't necessarily and we certainly haven't seen yet anything like a world patent but there is certainly a lot of suggestion that what we should be doing is at least trying to um, harmonize what 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 it means to have a patent in every country uh, so that things are easier cheaper simpler um, more streamlined for uh, companies to operate in the in the modern environment uh, the America events act of last year of course uh, as I discussed uh, in class one a little bit, uh, was um, an important aspect of this uh, by uh, creating the first to file system in the U.S. Um, and thereby harmonizing us with the rest of the world. Um, harmonization takes many forms. It might mean that the law um, of patents looks the same in every country. Uh, it might be, and what we're seeing increasingly, that there is a lot of interchange between patent offices in various countries in the world. For example, uh, it's pretty typical now for um, the U.S. to, uh, to review uh, a, uh, a patent search or a patent evaluation uh, done by, uh, for example, the European Patent Office. Uh, or uh, for a, an applicant to um, seek examination in Japan and then uh, submit the results of that examination to the U.S. for hopefully faster review. Um, there are systems whereby you can file, you can have a common examination system uh, and, and file a patent almost at once. Um, uh, in uh, a number of countries. Um, and so this is the, some examples of harmonization and I certainly think that you're going to see a lot more harmonization as things go forward uh, uh, in the future. All right, so let's start in number two, uh, the theories of patent law. Right. So the first thing to think about is what, what do we mean about an ide the idea of a patent? What, what is a patent? Right. Uh, lots of things to unpack here. One is, is it a state-sanctioned monopoly? Right. Is this something you know, like uh, back in the royal era that, that is granted by the state uh, in exchange for doing something good. And obviously that something good these days is, you know, some sort of technological uh, innovation. So that's one possibility. The, uh, another possibility is that it's um, more of a social bargain. That instead of a, a state-sanctioned monopoly, uh, it's, it should be conceived of as you get uh, something commensurate to what you um, offer to society. And so the fact that you've offered society this particular kind of advance uh, means that you can uh, then reap the rewards of having that kind of uh, advance um, through a patent. Um, is it a property right is another important question, right? Because uh, if it's merely a state-sanctioned monopoly, right, you could almost think of it uh, as something like a license to broadcast radio on a certain radio frequency spectrum, right? Um, not so much a right as much as just a, a grant of a particular uh, that has value in a particular time and place. Um, if instead you think about it like a property right, that has different kinds of implications, right? Because that means um, that it's a, in a sense, a freestanding piece of property, could be traded, um, uh, sold, rented, leased, uh, potentially split up, things like that. I mean, property has a number uh, of other features that come into play uh, that would not necessarily be present if we thought of this as merely a, a government grant of some sort of, of right. And then is it a right to exclude or a grant of some value? I mean, this is, again, something to think about, which is 
the way that we actually do patents in the US is that it's a right to exclude. You don't get anything uh, if you receive a patent. I mean, you do get something, you get the patent, but the patent is just a piece of paper. The rights that you get uh, are completely dependent on whether you are able to exclude people from a relevant marketplace, which means if your invention is uh, of something that has no marketplace value, then your patent has no value as well. Um, and vice versa, right? If your invention is something related to great market value, then your patent is going to have great uh, economic value. And this is different than other systems you could imagine where we uh, would grant um, you know, a reward or a prize or some sort of funds to somebody who has done something uh, good uh, rather than giving them a, a right to exclude. And so all of these things are sort of floating out there with respect to um, uh, patents. Now in the U.S. we traditionally think of patents as property rights and in fact the, the patent statute explains patents as being uh, essentially the personal property. Uh, what that means is you can buy and sell them in the U.S. Um, you can license them. Uh, you can't really divide them up, but you can certainly divide up the rights uh, in, in various ways. You could say somebody has uh, the rights to the patent in the state of California. Uh, somebody has the rights to patent in, in, uh, in New York City things like that. So you, you can do a lot of things by uh, layering on contracts to the property right that is the patent. And again, as I noted earlier, we do think of it in the U.S. anyway as a right to exclude rather than anything that gives you uh, necessarily any right to, to an economic return. The underlying theories, though, are, are uh, somewhat mixed as well. And there's a lot of competing theories here. So the first one, and, and perhaps the most basic, and a lot of you will remember uh, this from property law, is sort of a natural rights or Lockean labor theory, right? And you can use natural rights to justify uh, a patent system in the following way. The idea here is that by creating this innovation, by using your intellectual labor uh, and mixing it with whatever has come before, that is the prior art, the things that you experience in the world, you have then created something, created a piece of property that is then by virtue of your labor or by virtue of your natural right um, owed to you and owned by you. And that would be the way to, to defend a, a Lockean uh, approach to, to patent law. Um, that's not the only approach. There's another type of approach um, uh, which is uh, uh, most commonly associated with Professor uh, Peggy Radin, um, actually at Michigan now, um, and that is personhood. And the idea of personhood uh, is that the, the justification for the property right uh, is that by creating this thing of your intellectual labors, you have um, essentially made it a part of your person. Uh, and that because of that, you have uh, a inherent right to control it in various ways now. Um, and so that would, again, justify uh, a way of uh, a mechanism of patent rights because uh, inventors would thereby um, be assumed to be uh, more fulfilled, uh, have a, a stronger sense of personhood uh, as they get rights uh, to their inventions. The third and overwhelmingly the dominant approach, or the way of thinking about patent law in the United States, uh, is utilitarianism. Right? Utilitarianism uh, is is the idea that we are uh, offering uh, these property rights, these patent rights, up uh, as an ends, uh, as a as a means to an end, as a reason, as a uh, trying to solve some sort of problem. Uh, and, and that that's how we justify the rights and that there is no, in a sense, a natural right to having a patent just because you've worked hard. Uh, you don't necessarily get a patent. Uh, just because uh, you are very attached to your idea doesn't necessarily mean you should uh, get any rights to it. Uh, what matters is does it advance society? Does whatever goals that we've attributed to the patent system, uh, are they advanced by offering you the patent? And if they are, Good. If they're not, then we are not, as a social matter, going to want to give you a patent. Uh, 
Uh, that's the basic idea of utilitarianism. And as I noted, this is pretty much the way uh, that we think about patents, and, and, and certainly in the U.S. and, and generally worldwide, although you see more uh, discussion about uh, natural rights and, and uh, labor theory in other countries. In the U.S., you really, you really don't hear about it very much at all. But that's still, even if we decide that ut utilitarianism is our animating principle of these property rights, our animating theory, that still doesn't tell you about what is it that we're trying to achieve here. All right? And that's, I think, what we, we want to take up uh, right now. And the first thing is to, to understand uh, that how patents are, in a lot of ways, like lighthouses, and that this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, lighthouses, as many of you may know, um, are a particular are described in economic terms, in particular as as having particularly uh, interesting characteristics. Right? I mean, lighthouses are known as public goods, and what we mean by that is that they have particular economic characteristics that make them very likely um, to be underproduced in a normal uh, functioning uh, economic system. And, and you can think about, for example, why. Lighthouses uh, are um, markers, of course. They tell ships not to run ashore. Um, but they have this problem, which is, um, why would you build a lighthouse? Because uh, if you spend the money to build a lighthouse, uh, then all of your competitors, your shipping line competitors, for example, uh, would be able to um, get the same benefit to it uh, as you would. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't stop them from looking uh, to see where the shoal is marked, uh, and because of that, there's no incentive uh, to uh, for any individual or company to build lighthouses because it's much more rational to simply free ride on the efforts of others, right? And what usually happens in these cases, and in fact, what does happen in the case of lighthouses, is that somebody else uh, comes in, a third party comes in, and and creates the, uh, the, the good that is needed uh, to advance society, here the government, right? So this is a, a classic example of where government spending is needed uh, in order to um, solve uh, what is known as a public goods problem. And governments then build lighthouses. They, they do that by financing it through taxes. Uh, everybody's better off because having more lighthouses is, is better uh, than having ships run ashore. Uh, and the incentive problem is fixed uh, because uh, the government can work for the collective good uh, rather than worrying about individual incentives. And that's really very much like what's going on in the patent system, right? Which is inventions have a public goods problem as well. And, and it's really three um, related um, uh, but distinct issues here. One is the appropriability problem. And this is most like the lighthouse, right? So, so most inventions, once you figure out what they are, uh, what the characteristics of the invention are, uh, somebody else can build them. Now, it might be expensive. To build them, I mean, it'd be hard to build them. It might take them a long time, um, but in general, if if I um, you know show you an invention, uh, sell an invention to, into the public market, it can be copied, right? And so, and there's not a lot I can do about that, absent of course a patent system, right? Uh, so there's an appropriability problem, much like uh, you can't keep people from looking at lighthouses, uh, you can't keep people from copying, say, your pharmaceutical drug or something like that once it's out there in the uh, in the marketplace. Another problem is uh, a secrecy problem, right? Because the the natural uh, way to deal with uh, your ideas being stolen would be to keep them secret, right? And and so uh, if you don't want people to steal your stuff, you you don't let them out, right? You don't let 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 them at it. So you uh, keep them secret. Now that is a particularly problematic. Uh, economic problem in, in the area that, of innovation because innovations aren't any good if they're kept secret, right? I mean, innovations uh, to the public uh, don't, don't benefit the public as much, uh, if at all, uh, if they aren't out there, if they aren't being sold, if they aren't being distributed, if you can't tell people about them. Uh, and so solving the secrecy problem uh, is another uh, problem uh, of a public goods nature that has to be solved as well. And then finally, there's Arrow's information paradox. Um, uh, Ken Arrow um, uh, noted that there is this paradox of information, which is if I want to generate a valuable idea, 
I want to trade in valuable ideas, if I want to um, uh, have you purchase my idea or license my idea, I have to tell you the idea. But once I've told you that idea, then I've lost any opportunity of getting any rents, getting any value for that idea because you then know the idea. Um, so this is the paradox of trying to transfer information is that uh, valuable information um, is more valuable when shared but the sharing of the information can destroy the value uh, to the original creator and thereby destroy incentives to create it in the first place. And again, this is a, a type of a public goods problem whereby if we didn't step in in some way, people would not have enough incentive uh, to invest in uh, innovation, new ideas, new uh, things, and, and, and transfer them as well. So the solution, or what we think of as a solution for, for our purposes in this class, is to grant patents. Right? Patents provide appropriability, right? The fact that I have a patent means I can sue somebody, get money damages, potentially an injunction, uh, has real teeth. Uh, I use the federal system. Uh, you know, the U.S. Marshals can come. They can drag people away if necessary. There's real appropriability uh, possibilities with patents. Right? Secrecy is not as much a problem anymore because the way that the patent system works is, is it, it encourages uh, people to openly display, tell, share, uh, and indeed trumpet their ideas uh, because that's the way you get a patent. You cannot get a patent by keeping your ideas secret. In fact, that's a core tenet of the patent system. So by forcing people to come out into the open with their ideas in order to get a patent, uh, it resolves a secrecy problem. And of course, that means you don't have a disincentive to, um, uh, to give up your secrets uh, as you would before. You have an incentive to, to create this new information and not keep it secret and instead file for patents uh, and, and protect it in that way. Um, and thereby solve that problem. And it also makes information much easier to transfer, right? I mean, this solves in a large way measure uh, Arrow's information paradox by saying, you know, I can share my idea with you now as long as it's patented because even if you know my idea, that's great for you, but you can't use it because I can get appropriability uh, aspects uh, through the enforcement mechanism of the patent. So uh, this is the idea. Is that we are trying to solve a public goods problem with the patent system. Uh, we're doing so by providing appropriability, by requiring openness and a lack of secrecy, and enhancing the transfer of ideas. So really what we're talking about in the utilitarian basis of the patent law is that the patents are a means uh, to an end, right? And that's, I think, the most important thing to keep in mind. If you get one thing from this lecture is to think about patents as, as what they are, which is a means to an end. They don't, at least the way that we think about them in the U.S., they don't have any inherent justifiability except to the extent that they actually provide a solution to the problems uh, that we noted earlier. And so the questions, of course, are what are the ends uh, and what, are the what is the mechanism? Now, class three is going to be a lot about the mechanism, the, the economic me mechanism that's used to create uh, the patents or to create the incentives. Uh, but what does the patent law create? Well, first and most obviously, it creates an incentive to invent, right? Because you can't get a patent unless you actually invent something new, useful, and non obvious. So there's an obvious incentive to invent. Um, an incentive to disclose. Talked about this a minute ago, right? I mean, you can't get a patent unless you disclose to the, to the public your idea. Uh, you disclose to the public by filing a patent application, which will ultimately become public uh, if you become, uh, if, if the patent is granted. So it encourages people to disclose their ideas. Um, and note that it's not only to disclose their ideas in uh, patents, but it encourages people to disclose their ideas in other ways too, because if your ideas are protected uh, by a patent, then the more you distribute them, uh, the more value your patent is going to have. So uh, the, the fact that you have to file a patent application describing your invention means you're much more likely to also write a scientific paper that describes your idea in great detail or to promote your idea um, commercially uh, by advertising it uh, than you would otherwise. 
The other thing a patent law can create is an incentive to commercialize, right? And this goes back to the fact that we, we're not giving you a prize for getting a patent. What we're giving you is a right to exclude in the marketplace. And that right may or may not have value. It only has value if there's market value. Uh, the way that you get market value is by commercializing your invention. That is selling stuff or licensing somebody to sell stuff that embodies your idea and thereby makes money. Uh, and so it can encourage people to actually commercialize their inventions. Patents have no value if they just sit in a desk drawer. Uh, what they need to do is be actually created, somebody doing something uh, related to them uh, that has real economic value. Right? Another thing that's often overlooked but can, that might be in fact one of the most important incentives that patent law can create is an, an incentive to design around. And what we mean by design around is uh, that if somebody has a patent uh, and they are asserting it, for example, against me, then I have an incentive to either, of course, pay them uh, and get a license to the patent, or I can try and design something different, something that's not infringing their patent grant and yet still solves the basic problem that, that uh, the invention, uh, the patented invention is trying to solve. Um, this is called a design around. This happens all the time. People will look at patents, people will look at products, and they will design new things that solve the basic problem without actually infringing. Um, and indeed, lots of research shows that it's often these second or third generation ideas, these design around inventions, uh, that end up being the really valuable ones, right? And it, it might be that by forcing people to think outside the box, to think of new ways of doing existing activities, you get even more innovation than you would if people just got a patent and didn't have to do anything else. Uh, Obviously, there's also incentives created to invest in research and development, right? The fact that patents have value uh, and that your research and development enterprise can be protected in some way uh, encourages business owners uh, to invest uh, in those uh, activities as well. And so one of the things which we'll talk about in the, in the class session is which of these things do you think is the most important? Which of these things is giving us um, the biggest sort of bang for our uh, patent law buck? Um, I think, I mean, my own personal views are that incentives to design around are often underappreciated, uh, that people don't think about that uh, as being uh, a key incentive, but in fact, a uh, patent system does generate very significant incentives to develop products uh, and ideas that are different than the ones that have come before, because those are the ones that both avoid patents and can often get new patents. Uh, I also think incentives to commercialize are, are important as well. Um, uh, it you know, goes hand in hand with the market mechanism. So again, just sort of the, the overview here uh, is that this is uh, all about uh, the lighthouse trying to solve this public goods problem. Uh, what we do uh, in the U.S. is we grant patents, uh, and we think that these patents offer a number of important incentives, uh, which I've listed here. Um, uh, all of these, I think, are very important uh, and, uh, and try and solve the basic problem that we would not get enough innovation, we would not get enough invention uh, unless we had some sort of patent system. Now this is not a um, uh, slam dunk case. We're going to talk some in class three about whether or not there are alternative mechanisms for uh, how to deal with uh, this basic public goods problem and, and also how bad the public goods problem is. Uh, lots of people argue that, that it may not be as much of a problem. Other areas of intellectual property, uh, the, the public goods problem may not be so clear. For example, in copyright, right? Is it really the case that without the incentive structure of a copyright law, the enforceability of a copyright, um, that people would stop making art or music or books? They might, but then again, they might not. And I think the empirical case is not known well. And in fact, we don't know a lot even about the empirical case uh, for patent law. And so um, that's uh, an open question, one that we'll discuss in class three, of course, and, and beyond. Um, so really what we're going to talk about next class is the, is the mechanism, right? So how to, does patent law work? Let's talk about this real, uh, real quick just to introduce it to you. Um, so patents are an intervention into a free market, right? I mean, so this is an important thing to understand is that a free market would have no patents at all, right? There would not be these state-granted uh, patent rights. Uh, 
Uh, the reason we justify this is market failure, right? The market failure here we've already talked uh, about is, is that the inventions are public goods. They have aspects of public goods. The ability, ability problem, the secrecy problem, Arrow's invention and paradox. paradox. They're not they're rival. Uh, they're not excludable. Uh, and so public goods will be uh, under, underproduced. Right? And, it, right? and it, you can ask you can yourself, yourself what you think this actually describes the ideas and inventions. Um, um, may, may, or it may not, not be one thing to ask yourself, yourself is, is it is it is it an an institution institution example example of the fact that you don't you don't need uh, sort of sort of a, a uh, economic incentive and to create uh, new, new innovations. innovations. There are there people are all over all campus, campus, campus uh, at Penn, Penn who are developing new ideas, ideas all the time, all the time. Uh, not because they're going to get uh, extreme, extreme rewards, rewards for them. Now they might get they some, might and indeed the university does file some patents, and there's a patent structure that allows individual inventors here at Penn to get some reward. But that's not going to be as significant, say, as for a company uh, who invents you know, the, the next uh, cure for cancer and uh, thereby reaps those rewards. Um, so it might be that you could argue that, that it's not so true that without these sorts of incentives, there would be dramatic underproduction of ideas. Um, and, and so that's one of the questions we're going to take up uh, in class three. Another important question, um, really, is uh, how strong should your patent rights be? Uh, and, and so one of the things to understand is that the patent system is all about trade-offs. Uh, and we'll talk about what those trade-offs mean um, in a moment. Um, and, uh, and, well, actually we can talk about them now, which is, so let's, the, this is your basic economic demand curve. You've probably seen this a lot. And so if you have a competitive equilibrium, um, that red line there is a is the demand curve. Uh, what that means is that every at a set price uh, on the left hand uh, on the y axis, if you set a price, there will be a demand um, uh, or a amount of demand for the the good or service at at that particular price. So you go horizontally along the green line till you hit the demand curve and then drop down, and that will be the quantity that gets produced. Uh, at that particular point. Now, in a in a competitive equilibrium, right? What happens is uh, the price of the good um, ultimately, at least in theory, will trend towards the marginal cost of the good, right? What that means is uh, the marginal cost, which is the amount it costs to make one additional copy. So if it costs me an extra dollar uh, to make each extra each widget, um, then the price in a competitive market of widgets should trend uh, towards one dollar. Uh, because if I price my widgets more than one dollar, somebody else uh, will produce widgets for about a dollar, and people will buy those widgets rather than my widgets. So I will be forced to cut my price. Uh, how many widgets will be produced uh, between all the, the parties in the market will depend on uh, the demand curve uh, and the marginal cost. What happens when you introduce uh, patents or a monopoly is that you can set a price uh, at a much higher point, right? Um, uh, actually, I should probably clarify the total amount of value that then is generated in a competitive environment uh, would be that blue square that's on the graph, right? So that's the total amount of value, price times quantity, uh, that's given to the producers uh, of the goods. Um, obviously, in a, in a marginal cost situation, there's not a lot of profit there, but don't worry about profit. Think about it in terms of, of the revenue. What happens in a, in a monopoly situation is that the producer of a good can price it significantly higher. Now, you wouldn't price it to infinity because nobody would purchase uh, you're good at infinity, but what you would do is you would price it at an optimum point that is much higher than the competitive cost. And why would you do that? Well, because the area, the red box in this case, that area, that value um, is higher, is larger, sorry, meaning you get more value, more money uh, than by pricing it at a competitive level, and so thereby you reap more rewards. So it is rational. Uh, for somebody who has a monopoly to price higher. Now, there's a number of problems with this. 
um, uh, from a societal perspective, one major one is that you can see what happens to that yellow line, right? The yellow line drops. What does that mean? That means there's less quantity of the good being sold, which means less public benefit, um, assuming the good has some sort of public benefit and it's not actually harmful to the public in some way. Uh, we generally think that the more goods and services that the economy has, the better. Um, so monopoly pricing yields less goods and services and therefore it is not as good. There are a number of other important costs that we'll talk about in class three uh, of monopoly pricing. But this is the basic idea, right, is by giving people uh, marketplace power, by allowing them to price uh, above marginal costs and thereby um, uh, reap additional rewards above um, what they would get in a competitive environment, you are generating this economic incentive, which then generates all of the incentives we talked about before. So that's how uh, this basically works, and uh, this is what we're going to explore in some more detail uh, in class three.